In the late 1980s, Inga Maria Hauser was a student in Munich, Germany. She was 18 years old with a wanderer's spirit, someone with a thirst for art and creativity and inspiration. And she was on her way around Europe, collecting memories and experiences to fuel her dreams of becoming a singer. In March of 1988, Inga packed her bags and said goodbye to her family, heading out on what would be the biggest and potentially the most meaningful journey of her entire life. She first headed to England, then travelled up to Scotland, hitchhiking as much of the way as possible, minding her money so she could make this trip as long as possible. But there was one part of the journey that she couldn't hitchhike across, and that was crossing the sea from Scotland to Northern Ireland. For those of you unfamiliar with Irish and British history, between the 1960s to the late 1990s, both countries were locked in a very difficult and bloody period of history. Tensions between the Irish and the British often spilled out onto the streets in very often deadly outbursts of violence, and many civilians were caught in the middle. These times are often referred to as the Troubles, and the Troubles had many people too afraid to make the journey into Northern Ireland, no matter which border they would have to cross to get there. But Inga wasn't one of those people, When she boarded a ferry bound for Larne in Northern Ireland on April 6th of 1988, she was full of excitement. She'd kept a journal through all of her travels, documenting her experiences and the places she'd visited. And that day she wrote, quote, Morning has broken in Scotland. Breakfast in Inverness. Nice town. Have to see the Loch Ness Monster one day. Going to Glasgow now. Snowy mountains and wild landscape. Scotland is beautiful. Inga seemed to have a way of saying a lot with only a few words. We get a sense of her personality here, with her joke about the Loch Ness Monster, and almost a sense of romanticism with the way she describes the Scottish countryside. But something would happen to her in Northern Ireland that would twist that sense of life and spirit in her words and forever change Inga and the people who knew her. Witnesses would recall seeing Inga travelling with a man on the ferry. She looked happy and at ease and no one remembered seeing anything suspicious. But after the ferry docked in Larne at 9.40am, things would take a turn. Just like that, Inga disappeared. This was nothing suspicious at first. After all, she was a backpacker, and the whole point of her journey was to see as many places as possible. Her family back in Munich later received a postcard she'd sent before boarding the ferry in Scotland, but with that, all signs of Inga seemed to dry up. Almost two weeks to the day of Inga sending that postcard, a farmer out tending his sheep in Ballypatrick Forest stumbled across a gruesome discovery. In a remote clearing, one that was only typically known to and visited by the locals, he found the lifeless body of a young woman, face down in the grass. She was partially nude, signs of all manner of abuse littering her body, her face and neck showing clear signs of violence. Not knowing what else to do, the farmer reported it to the local police, who inspected the body and confirmed so many suspicions. The young woman had been sexually assaulted and beaten, her death the result of a brain aneurysm from one of the severe blunt force trauma blows to her neck and head. 
A quick search of her belongings also confirmed her identity and a difficult call was made to Inga Marie Hauser's family back in Germany. Her family hadn't heard from her since they'd received the postcard, so even though they were devastated by her loss, they couldn't exactly help the investigators pinpoint where Inga had been and who she'd been with. But after the investigators discovered Inga's diary, they started to hope that it would hold the key to finding out who had done this to her. Inga had written in it almost every day, still in her brief yet descriptive style of writing, but as the investigators flipped through it, they found the last entry and any hopes that Inga had left a message for them from beyond the grave quickly dried up. The last entry was the one we read earlier, only documenting her mourning in Inverness and that she needed to get to Belfast. The investigators were left trying to piece together the storyline themselves with little to no evidence to go off of. A sample of male DNA was recovered from the scene, at least proving that one male was involved in what happened to her, but that was about all they had to work with. The leading theory became that someone had kidnapped Inga and kept her alive during the two weeks that she had been missing, only killing her close to the date that the farmer had found her. But it also didn't take long for that theory to change. Basing their decision off of decomposition rates, the theory then shifted to be that Inga had died shortly after arriving in Northern Ireland. This news did in some ways limit the pool of potential suspects, as it would have made a lot of sense if someone from the ferry had been involved in her assault and murder. According to witnesses, Inga had been very open about travelling alone, and that she was trying to be careful with her money. She also allegedly stated that she didn't know where she was going to stay that night, and then there were the witness statements that said that Inga had been seen talking with a man during the journey. The investigators tracked down anyone and everyone they could that was on the passenger manifest that day, but they also managed to conclude that the man that Inga had been seen travelling with that day wasn't involved in her disappearance and murder. With that, the biggest and most solid lead in this case went dry, and the police were left wondering where they should be looking at next. The theory then came that someone else on the ferry had overheard Inga talking about herself and her journey and had offered her a lift, only to do what they did and leave Inga out in the clearing. Based off what Inga had reportedly said during the ferry ride, she could have been more than eager to accept a ride into town, especially if she was trying to save some money. But how were the investigators going to find out who could have offered her such a lift? They went back to the passenger manifest, but it also didn't take them long to figure out that the manifest was incomplete, and that it was entirely possible that Inga had been picked up by someone who hadn't been recorded on it. They eventually tracked down and interviewed all 442 passengers, but none of them proved to be the man that they were looking for. The only thing that the investigators had to go off then was the sample of DNA left at the scene. Going off of the fact that the clearing was only really known to locals, Authorities asked Ballycastle residents to volunteer a DNA sample so that they could clear themselves of any suspicions. Many men came forward and many more through the following years as advances in technology continued to renew hope that the sample would be traced back to someone. But at the end of one of the largest DNA screenings to have ever been conducted in the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, the police still hadn't got a match. Left without answers, people did what people do best and tried to solve the case themselves. Their only solutions were based a lot more on suspicion than any physical evidence. Rumours began circulating that Inga had been killed by a British soldier. Another rumour had her being murdered by a female police officer after she'd found Inga sleeping with her father. 
Another one had her being the victim of a potential serial killer, but none of the rumours led to a break in the case. 30 years went by, and in 2018 the police announced that they were launching a new investigation into the case, hoping to finally solve it. This announcement was quickly and surprisingly followed by two arrests, one 58-year-old man and a 61-year-old man. They were officially arrested in connection with Inga's murder, and only a few months later, the prosecution submitted a file of evidence to the Public Prosecution Service, wanting to know if they had enough to take them to court. In another twist of this case, out of the two suspects that had been arrested, the file the prosecution had submitted had evidence gathered against only the 58-year-old man, but also had evidence against a 56-year-old woman, who they claimed had helped the man cover up the crime. Maybe the prosecution were right on the money, or maybe they'd been listening a little too much to the rumour mill and were clutching at straws. Either way, the Public Prosecution Service didn't believe that the file contained enough evidence to actually take either of the men or the women to court, and the two of them were released. That is, almost unbelievably, where this case is still left at today. We're still nowhere closer to finding out who assaulted and murdered Inga Maria Hauser, or why. In a BBC documentary, Police Service of Northern Ireland detective Superintendent Jason Murphy stated, quote, My belief is that the answers lie very, very close to a very small number of individuals, but that small number of individuals is difficult to unlock, particularly if they remain loyal to the individuals whom they may be trying to protect. That's the work we have been trying to do over the last number of years, to unlock what may be the final piece of evidence which enables us to bring this case at last before the criminal courts. We never give up the hope that those individuals who may have the evidence that they have carried for such a long time may one day see the need for them to come and talk to the police about what they know. The prosecution continues to hold out hope that this case will be solved, but what about Inga's family? Her family have talked to the press about the difficulties of not only losing Inga, but also not knowing what happened to her. They have also asked the community of Ballycastle to come forward if they know anything, no matter how small, but the community have responded in their own way. The tragic story of a young woman losing her life in their small village left visible scars for the locals, and in 2019, the community came together and erected a memorial stone in Ballypatrick Forest, commemorating Inga Maria Hauser and her spirit, and acting as a beacon of hope that the people who know what happened to her will eventually come forward and give Inga's family the answers they deserve. <laughs>